Our Old Testament reading comes from 2 Kings. We'll be reading 2 Kings, its final chapter, chapter 25. We'll be reading verses 1 through 12. And in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around him. So the city was besieged till the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night, by the way of the gate between the two walls, by the king's garden, and the Chaldeans were around the city, and they went in the direction of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. First and Second Kings is, is not really two different books, although we think of it that way. It's really one book. Uh, we break it up into First and Second Kings because that's how it would have been broken up. Uh, because of its length, it would be written originally on two different scrolls. So you'd have two different scrolls of the kings. Uh, but it's really one story, one book. It all begins in what we know of as First Kings with Solomon, with the death of David and, and Solomon's rise, his inauguration as king, his riding into Jerusalem. And right from the start, one of the first things that we learn of Solomon is that he, he builds the Lord's house, the house of the Lord, the temple. And then he builds a house for himself, the king. What well, this point here at the very end of that story, we see the burning of the house of the Lord, the burning of the king's house. This is the end of of that story, the conclusion in a way. At this point, God's people in Judah had abandoned him. So the, you know, the kingdom of Israel had broken up at this point. There were two kingdoms, the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, what we read about, and especially the, the latter prophets, is Israel. Uh, they had already been taken into exile. They had already faced this kind of cataclysmic end. But Judah still stood. The southern tribe still stood. The temple still stood. And they lasted for a time. But no more. As was prophesied by the prophets, as was experienced by Jeremiah, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar came and laid siege to Jerusalem. And this was really a, a climactic and final sign of God's judgment against what was an apostate people, a people that had completely abandoned him. 
They rejected him. They were spiritually adulterous, going after other gods, and so he left them. Right? We read about the house of the Lord. What is it that made the house of the Lord his house? What was his presence? When Solomon built the temple and he, he dedicated it to the Lord, we're told that the glory of the Lord, his presence, filled that place. But the prophet Ezekiel tells us that before this happened, the glory of the Lord up and left. The promise that the people would rely upon that physical temple as if just having it was a token of their safety, just being there, they would be okay. The people would offer vain sacrifice, they would follow other gods, they would live sexually immoral lives, they would be unjust in their business practices, they were oppressing those who had less power than them, they would lie and steal and cheat, they were murderous. But as long as the temple stood, they kept pointing to it, thinking of it and saying, look, we're fine, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, it's right there, we're going to be okay. Despite God's warnings despite the the many times that he called them to repentance, they still trusted just in that. And so he takes it away. He, He makes it clear at this point, clear to everyone that he had left them. But he didn't leave them completely. I say this was is the conclusion of the story. It's the conclusion of kings. It's not the conclusion of the story, as you well know. It's a horrific end, right? It's it's a horrific close to a chapter of this story of redemption that God was writing. We read about King Zedekiah having to watch as his sons are slaughtered in front of him and his eyes are gouged out so that the very last thing that he sees is the death of his sons, the death of his lineage. It'll be the last thing imprinted on his mind for the rest of his life. It's a horrific end. We read about the famine. Maybe you know something of of the the absolute suffering that comes with true famine. See, what would happen is the Babylonians or any ancient empire at this time, if you wanted to take out a city, you would surround it. You would cut off their available food. You'd cut off their water if you could. Jerusalem had some of its own water internally, so it, it could last in that way. But when you cut off the food that could go into the city eventually they run out and you would just wait you wouldn't go and risk all of your men going trying to lay siege to the city right away you would cut them off until they begin to suffer greatly that's when you would actually go and bring an end that's what they did but god had promised that even after judgment the people were going to return they would rebuild the house of the Lord. They would rebuild Jerusalem, that even in exile they could look forward to that. Indeed, we read about it in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. I can't help but even even as we just read this, notice that it ends by saying, but the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be what? To be vine dressers and plowmen. I think it should make you think of the, the wheat the bread, the wine that would come, these promises of God's blessings. It's still there. There's little hope, at least from an earthly perspective, but there's hope. Well, by the time, the reason I even read this passage is because by the time we get to Jesus' day, the unbelief and apostasy that had brought the destruction of this first temple it's come back. It's crept back in. God had cleansed the temple with fire, destroying it once. And he would do it again. He would have to do it to that second temple that was built. But the grace of God is more than you could imagine. And so even here, he had plans for a new temple, not a temple made of stone any longer. Right? He planned a third temple. And so Jesus, as he stood in the courts of that temple that would be destroyed, he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up 
in three days. And we're told that he was speaking about the temple of his body. Our New Testament reading again comes from John chapter 2. We'll be reading once again the story, the cleansing of the temple. This is John 2, verse 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this morning. You know, there is general agreement by Bible scholars, commentators, teachers, that John uh, chooses very specifically what signs, what miracles of Jesus he uses, and that he gives us seven signs. Signs we've already mentioned are in some way or another a manifestation of Jesus' glory. And there are lots of things we could consider signs, but generally speaking, especially in the Gospel of John, we're talking about miraculous events that display something of Jesus' power, his glory, that he is the Messiah. I say that there's general agreement, but there, are, there is a difference of opinion exactly what those signs are. And part of the problem comes because uh, over time there's been a, kind of a tradition of breaking up the Gospel of John where you have from the beginning of John or really after the introduction through chapter 12 of John, and we'd call it the Book of Signs. And then after that, there's a clear break. In in John 13, we begin Jesus' upper room discourse. And it's clearly different than what's come before. It it changes. But that's always referred to as kind of the book of glory. So you have the book of signs and the book of glory. And what many have tried to do in saying, well, there's got to be seven. Uh, John only does specifics and it, it can count up to that number. So we're thinking there's seven, right? That's that makes sense of what John does. But then what often happens is, is men will try to find those seven signs in the first part of John, in the book of signs. We call it the book of signs. So it, they must all show up there. That must be where we find them. And you should be really thankful that we don't have screens and projection in this room because if we did, I'd be so tempted to put up the meme of President Donald Trump of him just saying, wrong. And I would probably only get away with that once because you have good elders. They would never let me do that again. And hopefully I could withstand the temptation. But, but it's wrong. Uh, it, it's, it's not quite right. And this is another one of those things that's going to sound like it maybe doesn't really matter, but it, it does matter uh, because I want, you to, I want you to get all of the good from this feast that's laid before us in the Gospel of John. And the fact is, John's very, I think, specific in giving us six signs in the first half of his Gospel. But Jesus does tell us what the last, the seventh sign is going to be. Just as at the wedding feast, we said there's, it happens on the, the sixth day and there are six water pots, 
Just as later we're going to read in the story of the, the woman at the well in Samaria, that there are six men in her life, and Jesus stands before her as the seventh, just like, just like there are so many sixes that lead you to a seven in the Gospel of John. So there are, there are six signs that John gives before he gives the final sign that Jesus refers to in the text today. He's very intentional about what he includes. I don't know if you remember this, but we, we've talked about this already. The, the very end of the Gospel of John tells us that there are many signs that Jesus did. This is where we started. This is in John chapter 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why John includes what he does. And even in structuring it the way he does, he's, he's trying to help you, and by the inspiration of the Spirit, God himself is communicating to you the fullest manifestation of the glory of Christ, of who he is. And that takes place in his death and his resurrection, in what John refers to as his glorification. And I know maybe I've lost some of you because it, it doesn't seem that important, but, but it is. And I want to give you a picture of this because we're going to be going through each of these signs as we've already done the wedding feast. And I want you to see that they're all building together toward their final climactic moment in the death and resurrection of Christ, toward the seventh sign, the final complete fulfillment of all things in what Christ did in his death and resurrection. Everything's moving that way. And so let me walk through just beforehand that each of these signs, and, and it's going to seem like we're leaving the text we're in, we kind of are, but we're just, we're just going around. We're taking the scenic route we're going to go around a little bit and come back to it because Jesus, in the text we just read, is talking about what's going to happen later. So we're going to go around a little bit and, and come back to it. In each one of the signs that John gives us, each one becomes more and more public. Each one becomes a little bit closer to what that final revelation of Christ is going to be. And each one garners a little bit more antagonism toward Christ. The first of the signs we've already looked at in the wedding feast in Cana, where we're told this was the first of his signs. It was the first miracle that Christ did, declaring himself to be the Messiah, right? That he could bring all the promises of God, he could bring his people into victory and rest. And the second sign doesn't actually take place until later on in chapter 4. Here Jesus is going to heal an official's son. And we're told this is the second sign that took place in Galilee. It could mean that just, you know, again, John is, he's picking and choosing. He's not giving us everything Jesus did. He's being very specific. He could mean it's just the second sign in that place, in Galilee, that Jesus performed, but, but it truly is the second sign that John gives us. Miraculous event that portrays something to us of who Jesus did and is witnessed by, by many others. The third sign is when Jesus will heal a man at a pool in Bethesda. And here, the conflict just starts to rise a little bit. As people see what Jesus is doing, see that he's doing this on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, and, and the antagonism begins to build, that antagonism that we see in this first cleansing of the temple. The fourth sign is when Jesus feeds 5,000, where many people experience Christ's provision, a much larger group than before. Remember, in the wedding feast, it's just the servants that see what Jesus did. It's just the disciples that believe because of it. Well, slowly, the, the people that see his work grows over time. The fifth sign is when Jesus will heal a man who's born blind. This is when things really heat up. When those who are against Christ 
begin to plan and plot ways that they could take his life. This is when we're told that they, they had begun to persecute those who believed in Jesus by throwing them out of the synagogues. And at the same time, the amount of people who see this man born blind and hear his testimony continues to grow. The sixth and final sign that John is going to give us is is the closest to the finale. It's the closest to the seventh sign. It's the resurrection of Lazarus. In many ways, John will paint a picture that is much like what we'll see in Christ's own resurrection in that story. But even after this, even after he raises a man from the dead, we're told that though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. There's still a lack of belief from any outside of the disciples. And I'm sharing all that because you see then, as this is growing, it moves toward this final point that Christ is going to foreshadow in this text. It's moving toward the the final, the greatest, the central revelation of who Christ is, right? The climactic moment, the fullness of time, the day of the Lord. That's what is coming. And that's what Jesus speaks about in this text destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He's talking about that final moment that's coming. Now you know the scene but if you weren't here with us let me set it up again. Jesus has come into the temple during the Passover. There are animals that are there for sacrifice. There's money being exchanged. All of this had to be done to fulfill the duties that people had for the Passover. But it wasn't supposed to be done in the temple. It was something that would be done outside. The temple was a place for worship. And so they were in the outer courts, the courts of the Gentiles. And they were practicing this. And so Jesus clears it out. He chases the animals out. He chases those selling out. He flips the tables. He scatters the coins. And he tells them to take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. He's telling them, don't don't act this way in a place of reverence, in a place that's supposed to be devoted to the Lord for prayer for the nations. The temple was for worship, not commerce. I imagine that when Jesus was doing this, especially because we don't see, again, the antagonism that builds over time, people, are, people seem, anyway, to listen to him, to do what he says. And I wonder if simply the air of authority that Jesus carried with him, that we see in other places, when people heard him teach, they would say, how is it that this man teaches, though he's never been trained, right? But he teaches with such authority, not like the, the scribes and the Pharisees, he He truly teaches as one with authority. I think likely, especially here in the temple, Jesus had that same gravitas, that same air of authority about him. And so people probably thought maybe maybe we're supposed to listen to him at this point. Even the religious leaders, the Jews as John calls them, come and speak to him, but they they don't throw him out right away. They simply question him. And that's where we'll we'll pick up today. Let me read for us again verse 18 to 22. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. These religious leaders want to know what credentials 
Christ carries, right? They're concerned about his proper authority to do these things. And no doubt some of them maybe thought, you know, given that this is the kind of thing a prophet would do, maybe this is a prophet. And so they ask him to prove something about his authority to do such a thing. Give us a sign, they say. Now, in in what we've read in John, we know, the disciples know, we know he's already done a sign. He's already shown who he is, but he did it privately. He did it in a way that not many saw. And evidently, it's not enough that he speaks to them of the word of God, that he, he commands them something that is true. Right? Don't make my father's house a, a house of trade. It's, it's good and right. And they probably know that. But that's not enough for them. The word of God spoken by the Son of God is not enough. And so they ask for this sign. And that's actually where the problem lies. Right? Therein lies the rub. There's no sign that they will actually receive. The fact that they even ask for a sign at this time means that there must be, again, some part of them that that thinks maybe there's something true or right about what this man is saying or doing or who he is. But they still set themselves up as the judges. As if, in order for this to be legitimate, God had to win them over. As if God, in order to accomplish what he wanted, had to first get their approval. But Jesus did a sign before he even came to the Passover. You could say that the Passover itself when it happened, was a sign that he performed. He doesn't need them. He doesn't have to work around their chain of command. He doesn't need their witness. He doesn't doesn't need their go-ahead. And in fact, he'll never get it. D.A. Carson points out that D.A. Carson is a New Testament scholar. He says that a sign that would satisfy them presumably some sort of miraculous display performed on demand, would have signaled the domestication of God. It's a great line. Right? That they wanted a, God, a Messiah. They were looking for a Messiah. They were watching for the Messiah. They were expecting a prophet. We know that already. That's what they came questioning John the Baptist about. But they wanted a domesticated Messiah. They wanted a Messiah that would do as they said or as they thought was right. They wanted a a God who would work their way. But God wasn't trying to win their approval. That's a mistake that we make a lot. It's a mistake that we often make in our attempts of evangelism. It's a mistake that often comes, a misunderstanding that comes from unbelievers in general. Jesus didn't come doing signs because he was trying to do whatever he could to win them over. Right? The truth is, uh, he didn't come doing signs for us. Right? In a way, it's for us, but, but centrally, it was about him declaring something about himself. The truth is, He doesn't need you, right? He's not uh, desperate for you, like he could never do without you. He does love you, right? You're his creation. If you've come to him in faith in Christ, of course, he, he, he loves you as his child. That's true. He does love you. But God is whole, complete in and of himself. He doesn't need us. Jesus came 
giving signs because he wanted you to humble yourself, to repent, and to trust in him. Right? The, the problem in this situation was not that there wasn't enough proof already of who Jesus was. The problem is never that there's not enough signs. God hasn't done enough for me to believe. The problem is, it was, it continues to be, it always is the hardness of your heart if you refuse to trust him. In this case, it it wouldn't matter that he turned water into wine. It wouldn't matter if he healed a sick child. It wouldn't matter if he gave a paralyzed man the ability to walk. It wouldn't matter if he would feed 5,000 people out of one boy's lunch. It wouldn't matter even if he raised someone from the dead. Because the problem was not a lack of signs, a lack of, of proof, of evidence of who he was. The problem is a lack of submission, of repentance, and of humility. The problem wasn't Jesus' authority. He had the authority to do what he was doing. The problem was their lack of belief. Truly, they should have learned the first time that God destroyed the temple of Solomon. But instead, they really won't learn. Right? God will have to destroy this temple as well, the one that Jesus stood in. But God, in his grace, wouldn't do that until he established a new temple to take its place. So Jesus tells them, he gives them a sign. Now, you know, again, we just read about a sign that Jesus has come from. He could say, look what I did. He could say, look at these things. We, we know that Jesus has done other miraculous things. He could point to what he's already done. But instead he does give them a sign. One sign that he'll give for all. The seventh sign, meaning this is the, the, the perfected sign. We don't realize that until we get all the way to the end of John, but But that's why we started with the scenic route. So you understand, this is where this all leads. It takes you right up to the the point where you can see it all. And Jesus is telling you about it now. He's telling you about that view from way up high. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now they mock him, right? They, They question him because they don't understand what he's saying. What do they say? This temple has taken 46 years to build. Right? And you'll raise it up in three days? You'll build a temple in three days? It's taken us 46 years to work on? Now, when they're talking about this temple that took 46 years, they're talking about uh, really a kind of rebuilding or a, a remodeling of the temple that had begun 46 years before. This was the same temple at least physically speaking, as uh, what was built in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. But they had been remodeling it. They'd been changing it. Herod had come in and, and begun to do work on the temple. And it had been 46 years. And here's this man saying, I'm going to build a temple in three days. It sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds impossible. So they mock him. Right? How could that be? Now, that temple would be destroyed. It actually would be destroyed later than, than Christ's death, the temple that he stood in here. But it also wouldn't be finished building until 63 AD. It, it would be something like 30 years before they finished the work on this temple. And it was just seven years afterward that that temple would be destroyed, much like the first temple was. But Jesus wasn't even talking about that. Right? He says, destroy this temple, and we're told he was talking about the temple of his body. And there's an incredible poetry in his words. You could maybe call it an irony in this statement. 
because you could read it in a few different ways. Right? You could hear in this Christ simply stating a fact of what's going to happen. Right? When this temple, my body is destroyed, this is going to be a sign for you, and I'm going to rise again three days after. He's a prophet. He's telling them what's going to take place. He tells them what is going to happen that should be enough of a revelation and enough of a sign for them to believe. Even then, largely they wouldn't. But you could also read it another way. You could read it as a challenge. Right? Go ahead. This, this antagonism, the enemies of God are beginning to rise up against him, against the Messiah, against the king. Well, go ahead. Right? Go ahead. Destroy this temple. I know that you want to kill me. And I will let it happen. Destroy me, kill me, crucify me, and I will rise from the dead. Right? This is a spiritual battle that is kicking off in the courts of the temple. Who has the authority to regulate worship? Who has the authority to tell you how you can come to God? Who has the authority to say what God does and doesn't want? Right? Whose house is this? Whose authority are you speaking on? Who can speak for God? Who can forgive sins? It's a spiritual battle that's beginning, and Christ from the start draws this line in the sand. Go ahead, destroy this temple, and see what I'll do. You can also read it as a command. Right? Destroy this temple. In fact, that is its, its form. It's the command of God, his sovereign will leading to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Right? Jesus, at every point in his ministry, was in complete control. There was never a point where there were forces outside of him that were acting upon him, forcing him to do something he didn't want to do. This was always the plan. And he tells you at the beginning, from the very beginning, he says what it's going to be, that final sign. He tells you how he's going to finally reveal himself to the world. Therefore, we're told, after he was raised from the dead, this is how we know, this is what he's speaking of. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered and they believed. They believed the scriptures, they believed what Jesus said. Now, many of those involved in the temple system would believe we know that many priests, many Levites, many Pharisees would come to faith, but there were also many who continued in their unbelief. There were many who continued to reject the building of this new temple. The disciples believed. They believed. And they believed from the beginning. Right? They believed at the wedding feast. They believed even in seed form. It maybe wasn't mature faith it maybe wasn't the fullness of faith that would come after this final sign that christ would do but it was true faith and that seed would grow right they were going to see to truly see jesus as he healed an official son as he made a paralyzed man able to walk as he fed five thousand and they picked up all the leftovers of food they would see him heal a man born blind. They would be there with him uh, when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And they would believe. But it wasn't until his glorification, Christ's glorification, that final climactic moment of his death, burial, and resurrection, until he appeared to them in new life that they truly believed. And what's John's point in sharing this? Why does he want you to know this? Why does he want you to hear this word from Christ? 
Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and so have life by his name. That's what that's for, right? You can believe. Much like the disciples, you can believe even now. One of the things that this story teaches us is that it's possible to have Christ in your midst, right? For him to truly be present among you. It's possible for him to clearly speak. And should you continue in your hardness of heart, you will still reject him. If your heart is not changed, you still won't see him and you still won't hear him. You'll still reject him. And maybe you're here today and and you would say, maybe not out loud, but you would say, why hasn't God spoken more clearly? Right? If he's real, if he really wants these things from me, why doesn't he do something more? Why doesn't he make it clear? Why doesn't he show me some kind of sign? And the truth is, he has already. He has given a sign. He's given many signs. He has spoken clearly. He has made himself known. He has manifested his glory to the world. And you can see it. But you have to be humbled first. Right? You might say, well, it's not fair, right? Why can't he be more obvious about it? What, what could be more clear and more obvious than Jesus Christ preaching and telling you of his death and resurrection? Right? Dying and then rising again on the third day. What more could he say than to you he has said? Right? What more could be done? The problem is so often when it comes to faith, right, we say well, it's, it's his problem. God hasn't done enough. He isn't working like he should. He hasn't shown me what I need. He hasn't provided for me like I want him to. But he's not the problem. You are. Right? The need isn't his, it's yours. Friends, consider today if truly you might be refusing to listen to God in the scripture, refusing to see Jesus as he was glorified in his death and resurrection, and why that might be. Right? If it's not him, it means it's you. It's clear from the text that what the Jews cared about as they spoke to Jesus was their position their power their influence their glory they cared more for the glory of men than they did for the glory of God later on they're going to say that they're most worried that Jesus is going to cause the Romans to come and take away their position of authority that's why they wanted to kill him that's why they hated him because he was going to take that away from them So that was their problem. That's what stood in the way. So how about you? What is keeping you from the Lord? Right? It's not him. Right? It's not, it's not that there's not enough truth. Right? There's enough truth in the scripture we read today and in the hymns we sung today and the prayers that were offered today and, and in this sermon. There's enough truth for you to believe. Right? If the disciples could believe on that earliest day as Christ turned water into wine, you can believe knowing all that we have read about and heard about. So what keeps you is not, it's not God's fault. What is it? Are you too self-sufficient? Right? You don't want God to come and take away your position. You don't want God's help because you don't want to have to give him the glory to say he's the one that did it. You want to be able to say, look at what I did. Look at what I've accomplished in my life. Right? Is it your position? You don't want to give up 
the place of judge. You want to be the one that can judge God. What he does, what he says, as if you sat over him. Right? That pride, that selfishness. Right? Is it the pleasures of this life? Right? You know, well, if I take that next step, if I truly believe, that means I have to give up all of these things that I enjoy. I know he's going to ask me to lay them down. I know he's going to ask me to sacrifice those, and I don't want to. Right? You know that if you take that next step, then Jesus is going to require of you to stop fornicating, to stop greedily hoarding, to stop envying, to stop hating, to stop. He's going to require of you to lay down your life. I don't know what it is, but I can tell you that if you don't believe, the problem is not with Jesus. Jesus has been clearly revealed. Right? He says it, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And so when you encounter unbelief, whether it be in yourself, whether it be in someone else, it's, it's not because God hasn't done enough. It's not that he needs to be more clear. No, he has spoken clearly. Right? The problem is hardness of heart. And so we pray that God would soften our hearts. Let's pray that right now. Let's pray. Lord God, please soften our hearts. Change our hearts where they need to be changed. We do ask that you would give us true faith that we might see who Christ is, the full manifestation of his glory, that we might hear your word and know that you're speaking, that we might recognize your presence among us even now. We ask this not in our name, but in the name of the one in whom we believe. In Christ's name, amen.